We've talked about this a lot recently. We've talked about optimization in games. And I don't mean optimization in the technical sense, but more of a, I don't know, philosophical sense would be the word. Thinking that you need fast travel, thinking that you need a super forgiving save system, thinking that you need an in-game economy in a single player game that makes it easy to get access to every single tool and utility based item. We've talked about it before and I'm going to use the genre of MMO as kind of the backdrop here. In FF14, I have complained about the fishing system. I have complained about the inventory system. I have complained about the teleport system. <laughs> I have complained uh, about the combat for casters. I have complained about the combat for samurai. I've complained about the combat for monk. I have complained about every aspect of that game that causes friction. And I'm still working on my inventory video, but in writing it and in thinking about it and a little bit of a definite influenced by Josh Strife-Hayes. With FF14, the more I'm getting into the inventory system and what I would change, the more I'm arriving at this weird middle ground of, I don't think I'd change anything in FF14. I, I really don't think I would. I don't think I would change the design philosophy behind almost anything in FF14. I wouldn't change the way the inventory works. I wouldn't change the way the combat functions. I wouldn't change the I way... Think the way to fix 14's inventory system is by adding an extra bag where you can store all your frogs. There are no perfect games. It's all subjective. I feel that there are definitely perfect games, but on a game standpoint, not so much on a player point. Is that all agree with? We can explore that in a moment. That's actually a good point. But I wouldn't change anything about the design philosophy that has led us to where we are with FF14. I don't think the implicit problem with FF14, for example, is the inventory. I don't think it's the design. I think it's the execution of the current philosophy they have, which might be influenced by the actual design of the back end of the game. I'm not going to get into the programmer side of all of this because I don't want to explain everything. But right now, essentially, the way I would fix FF14 is to bring in two new inventory spaces, a die bag and a party favor bag. If not a party favor bag, I would bring in a crafting bag. An extra 130 slots dedicated to something else would make the game feel a lot better. Because the biggest problem with FF14 is every inventory space we get is not item agnostic. Every inventory space is almost explicitly intended for one thing or one item type. The reason I don't want to change everything which is where this is going to come in. I, 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 Well, not this video. I haven't watched it. I don't even know if it's going to touch on what I'm touching on right now. The reason why I wouldn't change it is friction in games helps you form a bond to the game. And by extension, if it's a community-based game, like an MMO, it helps you forge a bond with the people in that MMO and the community as a whole. I am right now going through and helping VV level, I think, Sage to 80 and then to 90. And we're running Boja and we're running roulettes like every other night. The last three or four nights, we have had nothing but people that do not understand mechanics. We've had WoW tanks. We've had Sprouts, I'm assuming, are Xbox players that do not understand MMOs. And we're dealing with a lot of the clunk that comes from an MMO. But those struggles and that friction will make some moments memorable. A lot of memories you have from games are almost always moments that were... You're right on the brink of failure due to some absurdity or just the difficulty in general. And when you overcome it, it's it's just solidified in your brain. I, I have a memory from Demon Souls that is probably my favorite moment from any Souls game. And I can't say it's my my first death on the 
the Tower Knight. For people that don't know what the Tower Knight is, everybody knows Dark Souls. Not everybody knows Demon Souls. So this is the Tower Knight when you first walk into his boss, boss arena. He's a very big enemy. He's got a very big shield. And when he falls over, his big shield takes up more room than he does. My most standout memory in all of Demon Souls is the first time I beat him. And I say beat him with quotes because I did kill him. But the way Demon Souls works and the way every FromSoft game works, really, you're going along, you commit it to an action, you perform the action, and usually action is registered as complete and then the game saves. There's always a delay in between those. So what happened to Demon Souls is the first time I beat this guy, he always falls over and I, I dropped my controller. I was celebrating. And when he fell, when he falls, his shield still has a hitbox and his shield can just fall on you and kill you. And because it doesn't save the game until about 10 seconds after he dies I died and it counted that as a death so I failed even though his health bar hit zero first that is clunky game design I, I I will I don't think that's arguable I think that's clunky game design but it's fun game design it's hilarious that his shield can fall on you after you kill him so you can win get smacked by his lifeless shield die and then have to go fight him again that is one of my most memorable moments in demon souls and i feel like every game that has clunk is filled with things like that i remember the first trap in in demon souls in the front of boletaria castle i believe it's the very first archstone but there's a path that started the trend in all souls games where characters are waiting on top of staircases why is my hand freaking out to push a boulder down at you now dark souls has the courtesy to make sure you can roll out of the way easily demon souls was a very rough around the edges game where the staircase with the giant cannonball at the top of it the character waits until you're up to the top of the staircase to start rolling the ball so if you're not aware it's going to happen you're gonna get hit no matter what. Whereas with Dark Souls in the, what, what's the prison called at the start of Dark Souls 1? The Undead Asylum. You can just roll off the side wherever you want to. There's a, there's a charming unforgivingness to Demon Souls, even though I will say it is the easiest Souls game. Demon Souls is easy. It has the largest backstab window. It has the largest parry window. A lot of enemies don't faint their attacks, but it's still fun. And the jankiness gives gives you a reason to remember things. That's just a memory I have. I don't know if everybody has similar memories like that. I have plenty of memories like that from RuneScape to Age of Empires to Civ that I played with Rich, Battlefield 4. And all of my big memories are times the game broke or failed. And I had to just work around that. Probably annoying to experience what makes for a good memory. To some people, yeah, I think it's a mindset thing. I, I don't... Contrary to what happens on stream, when the game is fun and something weird happens, I almost never have a problem with it. It's when the game isn't, when a game's design doesn't feel intentioned and then something goes wrong, I don't even want to play the game anymore. I don't even care anymore. What's the point of putting up with a world and an environment that was designed? without any real intent behind it or a feeling of intent that's also going to sporadically behave in ways that you can't predict. But if the environment's fun, the movement is fun and everything feels like it was designed with actual thought put into it. When things misbehave, I don't think it's as interrupting to the flow of the game. I don't think it gets in your way as much because you can look past it and laugh because it doesn't devalue the game. Let's watch this. A big thanks to my Patreon supporters for making videos like this possible, as well as exclusive videos you can only get over there for as little as a dollar a month. Thanks, and now on with the show. Quality of life is a phrase you'll see pop up time and time again if you pay any attention to discussion of games. A sequel. 
Well, optimizing on its predecessor's potential, for example, we'll likely see talk of how the game features quality of life improvements over its original. Optimizing Usually good. Made to the pricklier elements of a game's mechanics, so that a player experiences less hurdles, has to jump through less hoops in order to get to the meat of the experience they're here for. And Have they ported any of the Spider-Man games to PC, by the way? Any of the Insomniac games? I still haven't ever played them. I, I have not owned a PlayStation past PS3. I have been strictly PC since 2013, 2014 or so. Yes, all three of them. Wait, really? Ooh. How are they? I know they're good, but like, how are they on PC? Would they be worth even checking out? It seems like a fairly reasonable point of inquiry on its surface. We want games to function, right? To provide as smooth an experience as is possible without hitches or imperfections, right? Well, I don't know. The way that games have been discussed lately has gotten me thinking that perhaps this kind of talk has gone too far. At times it seems like people are approaching games in the same way we think about productivity software rather than pieces of art, and that is troubling to me. To that end, there has been plenty of discourse surrounding the recently released Dragon's Dogma 2 for none of the reasons its developers likely desire. Can we... I feel like nobody's talked about Dragon's Dogma 2 being the most unabashed redo of a game. Still waiting for FFX VI on PC so I can play as Clive. As CJ? Who? XVI 16, right? I don't know what Dragon's Dogma is. Dragon's Dogma was a... It's an art... I, I guess it's technically an, like a character action RPG. That's not, it was a weird game. It was an RPG that kind of borrowed from Monster Hunter and Shadow of the Colossus at the same time while being this big... Uh, uh, obtuse is how I would describe an open world adventure game. And it had as much clunk as you would probably imagine based on the description and the games it just borrowed from that I told you. So it had a very niche audience. I would describe Dragon's Dogma 1's appeal as Witcher 1 appeal. It was a game for crazy people. And Dragon's Dogma 2 is very much a redo of Dragon's Dogma 1 because Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't even say Dragon's Dogma 2 on the menu in the game. It just says Dragon's Dogma because it feels like a redo where they just went through and added some, and the video just touched on this, quality of life additives to the game to make it feel a little less terrible. Oh, oh. Odin's son! <laughs> With talk of a far less than optimal PC port being overshadowed by the decision to include microtransactions for key items, and when it was found that such items were readily available to be found in-game, talk for a brief time turns to how a game in this day and age could have the gall to leave out industry standards like fast travel. How could the devs waste players' time like that? As fast travel isn't needed. I, I, I'm going to call this a cold take. I don't care. I, I, I think this is a cold take. I think if you think this is an, if this is even remotely controversial, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to call you selfish. I, I just, <laughs> there's the hot take part. Fast travel isn't needed if the world is interesting. That, that's it. If the world is interesting, I, you don't need fast travel. And I'm sorry, if you don't have time to play a game that doesn't have fast travel, I guess you're just not playing the game. Not every game needs to take into account that you are working 40, 60, 80 hours a week and have kids or have other priorities in life. If you're not in a place where you can play a game, then you're just not going to be able to play that game. That's it. I'm not in a place where I can go down to the track every, every three weeks and drive a car. I'm, but I'm not going to sit here like track day should be more uh, more approachable for people like me. Perfection is in video games. You only need three things. A good story, good soundtrack, no microtransactions. Microtransactions can 
be unintrusive. I like to just walk in Skyrim microtransactions. Okay, if they're if they're vanity, if they're pay to win, it's pretty rough. The problem with the vanity argument that I really really dislike is I see a lot of people say that without taking into account that you are still losing something in that scenario, which is every game that has vanity only microtransactions. Go look at the default gear. It's always so garbage. It's always trash. There's never anything good. I'm going to point to FF14 for this. There are so many pieces of gear in FF14 that are so much better than anything on the Mog Station. Just flat out. 90% of the gear in the game is better than what you can find on the Mog Station. And the reason that is, is because things on the Mog Station are items that would not exist in universe explicitly most of the time. It's almost always things that are like a modern sweater, a modern vest, a modern skirt, a modern pair of pants, a hoodie, things that you would not encounter in the world. So they don't just give them out for free in the game. They're, they're little things. They're not explicitly just, oh, you want to look better than everybody else? Whenever vanity items become something that is meant to make you look better explicitly, then there's an issue. The vanity items should be a fun little bonus where you can help further support the game you're enjoying instead of, man, this armor I have, yeah, the stats are good, but I just look so dull and this looks so shiny because then the vanity items are existing to almost create a FOMO atmosphere. I have gotten more compliments in FF14 for my in-game gear than I ever have for any glam that I have put together using items I bought from the Mog Station. Also to touch on the, I just like to walk in Skyrim. Yeah, you don't, I never fast traveled in Skyrim because it has a cool world. We can talk all day about Skyrim having the most shallow story in RPGs in the last two decades but the world was cool. Skyrim was cool to walk around in. Fallout 3 was cool to walk around in. Fallout 4 was really cool to walk around in. And we put up with the bugs and everything because beyond that, the game was just fun to be in. They run vast distances between vaguer than is typical objectives that might not readily explain every part of their workings to players and are subject to all sorts of in-game systems, leaving players scratching their heads about- Okay, hold on. Can we talk about Dragon's Plague real quick? YouTube, I just tried to go back three frames. Thank you. So for people that don't know what Dragon's Plague is, it is a disease, I believe, that you can that your pawns can get in Dragon's Dogma which causes them to essentially i but anyone that's played dragon's dogma never if you're still here i think you said you had it when you sleep in a town you could just wake up and the dragon's plague could have caused your pawn to go insane and kill a bunch of people i love mechanics like this i i love anything that will if the player isn't on their toes just ruin their save file. I think it's hilarious. I, it's Demon Souls has it, and it's my favorite thing. <laughs> Hold on, let me find the character in Demon Souls. There's an NPC in Demon Souls called Yur, and this was the first big example of this that I can think of in the gaming industry. Like the first big, like mainstreamish example that really pushed a lot of people away from a game. <laughs> Sick. Can I be an evil ruler of Dragon Plague people? <laughs> Terraria has that. If you're not careful, your house can just be ruined. I like as long as it's com it's telegraphed to the player that it can happen and there are signs. I think it's it's a great thing to do. Demon Souls. I'm gonna say maybe a little little harsh because it was the first Souls game, the very first Souls game. We all know now. We all know in Dark Souls one, don't trust Lotrek. We all know there's a character in Souls 2 like that. We all know there's a character in Souls 3, probably. I haven't beaten that yet, but I'm going to assume you guys do. No, I, I don't. Patches, etc. There are characters in Souls games that always fuck you over. Always. So in Demon Souls, what would happen is I'll walk you through the experience of a player that didn't know about your... So me. You rescue this guy from, I believe, Tower of Latria. 
from a cage called Yurt. He does what everybody in every subsequent Souls games Souls game has done, which is be like, ah, thought I was a goner. If you didn't come along, I don't know what I'd do. Well, thanks for the help. Then you go on your way. You come back to the Nexus. Yurt is now there. Yurt is not somewhere that's easily seen, though. Yurt is around a corner, hiding in a tiny, tiny little, like, cubby. Just tucked out of every possible position of viewing except for one. And you have to go back there deliberately to find this guy. So you might not even know that he came back. Which is why I'm very adamant when new people play Souls, talk to everybody, always recheck every goddamn room. Now, Yurt will just chill. He'll he'll just hang out for, I I don't know, two, maybe three bosses. Me seeing a fog gate. I see <laughs> here we go again. Maybe you come back to the Nexus. And here's the order of which he will kill people. If he's left alone, Yurt will begin killing named NPCs around the Nexus in the following order. He'll just have two dead people show up. <laughs> the next is an important person. The next is a slightly more important person. The third is Patches, another important person. And so on and so forth. If you don't touch him, he will explain that he is Yurt the Silent Chief and say, my work in Boletari is almost done. I, w I have murdered every human left except for one and then he will turn hostile. Okay, he doesn't just leave. He will attack you. So, the problem is in Demon Souls, because it was so jank, in DS1, 2, and 3, if you attack somebody or piss off an NPC, you could always get them to chill out, calm down, apologize, make up with them. Couldn't do that in Demon Souls. If you hit somebody, they would aggro you, and that's it. They're mad for your save file. You have fucked that save file until you beat the game. And that goes for death. You cannot resurrect people. So if Yurt kills a bunch of people and then you kill Yurt, you're just missing like eight characters now that are explicitly important to your development as a character. And I don't mean like narratively, like as a character. <laughs> Love Yurt. I think he's hilarious. I will say Demon Souls does not tell you he's violent. It gives you no hints that he's violent. He is very unassuming. And then he just starts killing people. I'll defend Yurt. I'll defend Yurt for the New Game Plus structure. For people that haven't played Demon Souls, those one of the strongest weapons in the game, you can only get by beating the game one time and killing the final boss and then going through using the final boss's soul to forge, I believe it's called Demon Brant, which will create half of a sword that you can use. You can use it as a weapon beat the game again this time do not kill the final boss walk out the door restart the next new game plus and i believe that gives you access to the forge option for soul brand and you can combine those two and that will give you a sword called northern regalia which i believe it's either i think it's demon brand or soul brand but one of the swords also are needed to damage a character properly. It, it's really weird. I love Demon Souls. It's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it's about how to proceed. You mean to say we paid 60 quid for a punishment simulator? You are lying if you say this is fun. I mean, where are all the quality of life features? And look, amongst this- No. No, I don't think I will. This not the point? By comparison, I recently played through the entirety of Rise of the Ronin, and despite its- Oh my god, it's Rise of the Ronin? I thought it was Rise of Ronin. <laughs> plethora of what might be called optimizations to the developer's typically unforgiving formula, and despite its grand ambitions as an open world, here we have a game with traversal that might as well be a menu, as you point at a place on a map and can put your controller down while your horse just takes you there. Sure, it's easier, it's more comfortable than Dragon's Dogma 2's world can be, I suppose, but it's also so nothingy, so mindless. I mean, of course, micro 
microtransactions in a single player game are bad, but surely the more pressing matter I want to hear this guy Dragon's say Dogma purple burglar alarm. The... <laughs> That's so mean. That's so mean. Who's Ronan? I want to know him. I, I really want to play Rise of Ronan. Um, I also don't think there's a huge problem with having auto run like that in something. I, I think there's a good half step, which is auto run without just GPS tracking. It would be like if you could do that in Grand Theft Auto. And they have that. It's called a taxi. And you know what you get as a trade-off for that? You get slower travel time. So it's going to take you way longer to get there. Well, those that buy and use them so they can more efficiently zoom around this map are clearly missing out on precisely the in-the-moment dynamism of that game world that makes Dragon's Dogma so compelling. That friction with a game that suggests its world is bigger than just you and allows you to navigate it however you choose without the strict guidelines that other so-called open games might apply. So long as you are willing to accept the Okay, we gotta try Dragon's Dogma at some point. <laughs> Ronan sounds like the kind of guy that take you bowling. Cousin Ronan! Let's go bowling. Man, I miss GTA 4. That game was so cool. Love GTA 4. I think, I think GTA 4 is the best example of a multiplayer having nothing in it. Like, explicitly. Shadow Beast uses ye. <laughs> it's super effective. <laughs> Still being a great game, though. I love GTA 4's multiplayer. I still think it's the best example of... You don't need crazy playlists. You just need a fun sandbox, and people will have fun. You know what? Here's the proof of that. The the Just Cause 2 multiplayer mod. The, super good. Super good. Just Cause 2's multiplayer mod was the shit for like three years. I love Just Cause 2's multiplayer mod. Just a fun sandbox to dick around in. Sup, business? Hi, Fat Talk Cat. Welcome in. Hello. Hope your week's been going well. Spent years in high school just sitting around in lobbies with friends. In GTA 4 or just cause 2? consequences of your actions. All of this to say, those people buying the microtransactions, demanding that fast travel be readily available in every game because that's the industry standard, are to me no. essentially doing the equivalent of walking briskly past a cinema so they can say to others that they saw a film. They're treating literature like a flip book so they can do that weird CEO thing of saying they read 15 novels a day or something. They are, in substance, experiencing nothing. Nothing. Here's where the conversation get, like can easily get philosophical, which is, who are you to say they're experiencing nothing? Now, both my on-stream and off-stream opinion is this. Uh, someone with taste that actually cares about the medium as a form of art and as a form of genuine experience. So, yeah. <laughs> my stressful phone decided to kill itself Sunday in school stuff. <laughs> is the phone okay? <laughs> GTA 4. GTA RP server is still going to this day. Dude, GTA RP is keeping GTA 5 so high up in the rankings for games still. Yeah, I thought that was a little bit of a leap. Back. Welcome back. Thought what... Wait, Flem. Thought what was a leap. By the way. No, it's like dead dead. Had to get a new phone. Oh. Rest in peace. People buying microtransactions aren't the issue. They're not. And Rich actually brought something up that was interesting to me because it's a Steam. It, no one mentioned this when I was talking about it either. And this is the downside of talking about things on stream without explicit do context you know constantly. That Blizzard do not have our microtransactions anymore. Eh, they now only have macro ones. It's called Diablo 4. I don't know why he's focusing on people buying them instead of Capcom deciding to sell them. The, the problem with... Or the thing that uh, Rich made me aware of that I didn't even think about, and I'm surprised I didn't think about it, because the microtransactions are Steam DLC, they're one-time purchases. You, you can't just buy more of them. That's why there are Wakestone, A, B, C, D, and E. Because they had to put up five five rebuys. 
don't think the microtransactions are horrible. Like FF14 does them or skins, etc. There's there's a way to implement them for sure, but they have to be handled with care or they cause problems. And the biggest one I'm going to point to, I, I, I will cover this in the inventory video when I put it out. I am going to die on this hill that it is not spaghetti code anymore causing the inventory issues in FF14. I, I, I'm sorry. They've had 10 years. I've been in software and big companies. I know shit moves slow. I understand shit just doesn't get fixed that should be fixed because ah, we don't need to put time towards that. I understand that. I will die on the hill that the reason they do not dedicate time to fixing it, if it still is a code issue, is because they are making $2 a month Per, per spare retainer, which is 175 inventory slots per retainer that people are buying. I know so many people that I have seen with subs going, yeah, I have eight. Two times eight is 16 before tax. That is that is a sub plus a few dollars on top of someone's regular sub. There is no way Square is going to throw that money away that they're raking in from these people buying microtransactions. Or, bleh, from buying retainers. And those are the situations where microtransactions are bad. Where the game is inarguably getting shafted because of their existence. Just flat out. That pushback from Dragon's Dogma's game world and its systems is its art. And honestly, the discussion surrounding this has gotten me thinking about what we expect from games and why we as players continue to hold this medium to different, decidedly more corporate standards than we do other art. The idea that as an enthusiast, no effort should somehow be exp- Hold on, what does it say at the top? to hold this medium to different, decidedly more corporate standards than we do other art. The to be clear, I'm absolutely not referring to accessibility concerns here, which are clearly valid, incredibly important, and must be taken into account. I'm purely speaking of more commercial aesthetic concerns like convenience, boredom, wasting time, etc. Yeah, no, I I, I... I think the video is on the right track so far. It's... I, I was I got pushed back for saying I I was on the side of like not on stream but just from people off stream whenever I was saying I don't think Elden Ring Dark Souls or any game should have a difficulty slider just for explicitly accessibility purposes if Elden Ring is thought to need an accessibility slider for the difficulty that is the dev's decision. That is the artist's decision to make the art more accessible. If the point of the art is to be inaccessible, if the point of the art is to be difficult, that is their decision. That is not my decision to foister upon them. While I I'll while it is inarguably the best moral stance. That is, yes, Elder Ring should have accessibility options. I don't know if anybody remembers that discussion back whenever Elder Ring was first coming out, coming out when journalists were bitching about it being too hard. And then normal players were bitching about it being too hard. And there were a bunch of articles being written that were, should we add a difficulty slider to Elden Ring? If the point of the game is to be hard and inaccessible, that is on the developer and the, the creator to decide. If the point of their art is to be something that not everybody's going to be able to play. I I, I do not think Game I viewers, have... There aren't yellow lines telling them exactly where to go. <laughs> I don't think I have the, the, the reasoning to say that it should. I don't think anybody explicitly has any ground to stand on to explicitly dictate what an artist does with their art. When it comes to things like this, I don't think they do. And that might be a hot take, but whatever. <laughs> I like how Rain World did it differently. There are three different characters for and stories to play through. Totally fair. Rain World executed on that idea and they didn't they didn't just shoehorn them in as accessibility options either. They they made them a core component to a different experience. I'm all for in the accessibility game. options. Would be great to have a one hand mode for Stellar ah. Blade. 
There's a bit in Yeek that's kind of like that. Not difficulty wise, but just an ending that's impossible to get. And I like it. How is it impossible? Games whose, games whose main appeal is difficulty and accessibility definitely shouldn't have a difficulty slider. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a hot take. I don't think that's controversial to say. There's here, I'll, I'll break it down to be very simple in bite size. If the art has to be compromised because of something that the artist doesn't want, then there's no point in adding it. If, if it is compromising their vision, they shouldn't have to do it. And before someone goes, well, actually, game development is explicitly compromises. Yes, I work in software. Yes, I'm aware of that. But there's an implicit difference between compromises made to get to the end goal of the product you want. If the product is going to be done and then we're compromising more in a way that the creator, I want to be very clear here, the creator decides, betrays their vision or their intent, they shouldn't have to do it. Because I know the other thing that people would say is, well, you don't know what the artist wants. I don't. Most of the times the curtains are blue in a book because they just like the color blue. It doesn't have any bearing on the psychological state of a character. I remember both, but I also remember people who seemed to like the game, but just couldn't deal with how hard it was. And I felt bad because it's also like, I don't think they would make it easier. I watched a friend of mine who loved Skyrim and they loved playing Skyrim on very hard. They could not get past the asylum demon. They died three or four times and then gave up. And games are puzzles. Games are objective oriented. And that objective has existed from the start. It's, it's existed since the first Pong was invented on radars. The objective has changed size and scope. But the goal is always to learn the rules of the universe that you're in, the world you're in, or the setting you're in. And I say, I, I'm being that specific because it feels really weird to go learn the rules of the Pong universe. <laughs> if someone doesn't want to dedicate the time to learning how to deal with Elden Ring and its mechanics, fine. Then it's not a game for them. And if they physically can't, that is a discussion between the creator and the art they're making. It is a conversation of submitting feedback of the person with the accessibility concern and the creator. Learn how things work and get to what you consider an ending. You know what, Glacy, you may have just summed up how, <laughs> how I do play some games where, <laughs> where there's explicit ways to do things. If you hang around stream, you'll 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 see more and more of it of just we beat things in very unintended ways, and it's like fuck it, that's it. That's how I like. No, I'm not upgrading my weapon. I didn't even know there was an upgrade menu in, in Metal Gear Rising. I have beaten that game five six times, and the last time I played through it on stream, I think Flem, it was you who screamed at me. Like I didn't know there was an upgrade menu until about halfway through, and I didn't know there was a a block or not block button what, what a dodge i didn't know dodging existed in metal gear Rising <laughs> until about a year and a half ago <laughs> idea that as an enthusiast no effort should somehow be expected on my part to engage with and think about a piece to work past any imperfections or awkwardness oh my god mafia 2 is so good uh, we can't play Mafia 2 on here. We'd have to do it on YouTube because in that game, you collect vintage Playboys and there are many, 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 many nipples visible. They arise intentional or- Look at how good this looks! This still looks so good! Art direction carries any realism- Wait, any game over realism any day. Otherwise, hell, this very idea that art should somehow be made more efficient is to me antithetical to the very nature of art itself. So much of my favorite art, whether it be games, music, film, literature, or whatever. Thumper's an overrated rhythm game. There's the hottest take you're going to get from me tonight. 
great deal of its importance to me has come directly from the effort Ooh. it took me to really armor dig core. And I don't know what the hell the this is within a potentially harsh exterior, or better yet, to appreciate that very harshness as the beauty. Like if you told Napalm Death that they would be a bit more pleasing to more people if they just played more rigidly or cleaned up the guitar tone. If you told Hijo Kaiden or Peter Brotsman that they could heighten engagement if they just turned down the volume a wee bit or shortened their pieces, or if you told Chantel Ackerman that the viewer's quality of life would be improved if we didn't have to endure Jean Dielman peel quite so many potatoes in- This is an interesting comparison that he's making, or not a comparison, but literally who? That's why this is interesting. I, I think it's funny that this comparison is in my own head being met with, I don't know any of these fucking people. I think that makes it a good comparison, but I think it also means that people that would willingly misinterpret something so that they don't have to challenge themselves would go, well, I don't know who they are, so your comparison doesn't make any sense. Those feel like I'm very smart comparisons. I don't think they do. I think the point of the comparison is he, he we are he's pulling artists that are niche and artists who are very very fervently themselves because the whole point of this portion of the video at least the point he's making is if they change these things that people tend to not like more people would know them and by us going literally who the point is kind of being made it, it's it's like if... Okay, I'm going to pull up an artist from the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic fandom who is no longer really associated with it, but they got their start there. They started off as an artist called The Sound of the Aviators. And they always focused on orchestral rock. That's still what they focus on. Not the biggest genre. And because of that, because they have great production quality, but that is their genre of choice, they didn't blow up like The Living Tombstone did, who also came from the My Little Pony fandom. That is how he got his like kickstart, and then his full boost up was the FNAF fandom. But his little catalyzing agent was the MLP fandom. Everybody knows Living Tombstone because he made a very mass-appealing electronica-type of sound a lot of people i feel like don't know aviators because he still sticks with this almost orchestral operatic rock sometimes and it's not the most appealing thing to everybody i love it i think his music is fantastic but i would wager not a lot of people know who the hell he is i mlp my childhood traumatizer <laughs> all instances you'd be very quickly very explicitly told where you can shove your opinions in other fields artists are often respected for their obstinance for their unwillingness to cave to audience demands about how their art should be crafted purely so that said audiences could in theory more efficiently consume it and mindlessly move on to the next bit of content and so why is the expectation seemingly so different for games you know, perhaps this is all because the audience for games is more directly involved in the progression of a narrative, and an artist doesn't want said progression hindered by player irritation. But even then, I as a player can appreciate some clunk. Like, Killer7 is never going to be renowned Still need for to play Killer 7. as a quote-unquote good shooter with its on-rails movement and the need to stop in your tracks and go into first person and scan a room to make the enemies visible and slowly aim at their weak points. It's awkward as far as shooters go. You could examine this process and find a million ways in which it could be optimized to more contemporary standards, free movement and aiming for one, but the awkwardness is the point. It's not only tense in itself, its tension is heightened because it's new, unknown. It jolts the player out of their comfort zone and makes them think more deeply about what they're having to do, the context and narrative surrounding their actions. In a way 
that more conventional shooters would really struggle to achieve. On the more extreme side of things, Deadly Premonition's driving is some of the worst I have ever experienced in a video game. Its woeful handling and pinball physics only hampered <laughs> further by the fact you have to endure it so frequently and for so long as you constantly pause to check you're on the right path in this mess on your often minutes long drives between these samey looking destinations and yet I kind of grew to appreciate, dare I say love, almost every aspect of traversal here. There's something about having to stop and pull out a map to navigate these long drives that more convincingly nails the experience of navigating between small towns than any other game before it. This is what I meant by Fallout 3, Skyrim, and 4 have something in common. Nobody likes the overarching story anymore, I feel like, for any of these games. They all find them to be at least if they're not bad while they're enjoyable there are glaring issues but the reason people played the games and enjoyed them is because the world was fun it, dealing with this driving if you enjoy the existence in the world that the game presents to you makes sense to me it's why i enjoyed just cause two for so long even though yeah i did beat the game there was nothing else to do in it for me i literally did every side activity i still loaded it up all the time just to blow things up and play with the mechanics a little bit the same goes for twilight princess i have beat twilight princess so many times but the world is fun the same goes for okami i just like being in the world i like the mechanics i like experiencing the clunkiness that comes with oh okami is a good example of what someone could easily say is unneeded travel time even the fast travel in okami is the most out of the way nonsense that is just annoying to use i hate okami's fast travel so i just don't use it too often i'd rather walk everywhere because the world is so interesting i went and I don't know. Maybe this is a, a a naive thing to say. If you have never played a game and felt compelled to walk instead of fast travel, because in your mind, saving the time is such a high priority. I don't know if you are in a position to complain about the lack of fast travel. I really don't because you're not engaging at all. I, I, I'll turn this around on myself too. I complain about Ubisoft's tower problem in Far Cry 3, 4, 5, every Far Cry after 3 really. And I complain about it in Assassin's Creed games. I, I complained about it in Breath of the Wild. It's a genuine problem to me. I think games have gotten worse in an open world sense due to Ubisoft's prominence in the open world scene. I explicitly think they have negatively impacted things. Am I in a position to complain about it if I refuse to engage with them? Maybe, maybe not. I would argue I am because I have engaged with them. I've engaged with them enough that I dislike them. And that doesn't mean I've engaged with them once or twice and then complain about it forever. I tried it in Far Cry 3. I dealt with it in and Assassin's Creed. I dealt with it in Far Cry 4. I dealt with it in Far Cry 5 when I played a little bit of that. I, I have tried to re-engage with these mechanics over and over again. But Cell, I have two jobs, three wives and 12 children. I have little time to play. Well, that's your fault for having kids. You sacrificed your free time and you made your bed. <laughs> Whether that's a like a rude take to have on this, but so be it. But I don't have time to go down to the local track, like I said earlier, and, and drive my car around. I don't have time to, because I prioritize stream. I prioritize like other things, just flat out. But I'm not gonna sit here and I'm not gonna bitch at developers out of my entitlement. 
I'm like, I, I wish I could play the game. Yeah, you can wish all you want, but if you set yourself up into a position where you can't play the game, then I guess you just don't have time to play the game. That's all there is to it. There, there's no discussion in my head. Like Spider-Man, the fast travel is there, but why would you want to use it when you can swing around the city? Exactly. You know how you do fast travel, right? Here, I'm going to point to... Bethesda is good at map design, is the one thing that I think everyone should take away from most of their games. They design really good worlds. Their stories are just the parts that are kind of meh. Granted, I'm talking pre-2016-17 Bethesda. I don't know about Starfield now. I don't know what the fuck's going on in that studio. But you get to the end of a, of a Skyrim dungeon. What was at the end of every Skyrim dungeon? What was the thing that Bethesda was praised for that nobody else did until Bethesda did it? Oh, you get to the end of the dungeon? Here's a door to go right back outside, sir. So, oh, thank you, level designer. That's really nice to make me not backtrack through the whole insane dungeon I just walked through. That's really nice. I appreciate it. You know who stole that? FromSoft in Elden Ring. Like the same mechanic, just the same level design philosophy in the legacy dungeons. And it's a good design choice. Where the diminutive nature of these bespoke environments often belies the extensive, genuinely labyrinthine and winding roads one must navigate in order to get there. And hell, even the handling takes what most games essentially reduce to walking but faster and turns it into a process that requires at least some attention and focus in the moment, the mastery of which can create a sense of zen in those lengthy drives through low fidelity forests. Greenvale's continuous haze is as nostalgically comforting as it is suffocating, matching the uneasy vibe of the game overall. Suddenly, Deadly Premonition's awkwardness functions as legitimate mechanical storytelling. The game is richer, more memorable and resonant precisely for these imperfections having not been buffed out for the sake of optimization. And look, I get it, games are expensive to make, often requiring teams of people spending years of their lives trying to make a thing that investors are looking for a return on. My guess is that developers and publishers are understandably scared in an environment where engagement metrics reign supreme, where art has been reduced to content and there's endless amounts of it vying for people's attention at every second, that the audience will balk and drop your game at the first sign of turbulence, of jank or lack of quality of life features. But as we've seen, some of those most memorable and resonant experiences have come from precisely those titles where genre standards and player expectations have potentially been put to one side. You know, maybe we as critics, as an audience of players, could stand to be a bit more forgiving of those games that ask a little more of us. Perhaps the soul of an experience lies in that bumpy- I don't think it's people need to be more forgiving. I think- pe I, I, I think the core of it is just demanding- demanding concessions from art so you can understand or partake in it. I'm sorry, it's just entitlement. That's all it is to me. There are movies that I do not understand and I have to go have conversations about them. If you don't want to partake in a an art house film like The Witch from Robert Eager's 2016 film, if you don't want to partake in The Lighthouse, you don't have to watch it. But complaining that the movie exists is is it's naive and it's entitled because things in the medium you are enjoying, even if you enjoy bottom of the barrel, nor and I don't mean this in a bad way, but completely just mass produced Ant-Man 2, if, if, if the Avengers movies, if you enjoy those, you won't have those without art house films you won't have new things introduced into that area of the medium without the more fringe niche risky projects it's not the witch it's, it's the bitch the bitch yeah <laughs> not everything has to be enjoyed i don't enjoy every part of souls 
I have fun with every part of Souls, but I don't enjoy every part. And I have fun with some of them retroactively. Some of the parts of Souls that I will, in the moment, hate and hate and hate, the moment I overcome it is the moment I go, oh man, I need to do that again. Because the fun is overcoming the puzzle. The fun is solving what the dev has put in front of you. Which I didn't do with Manus. I talked about that last time. Manus is the only Souls boss that I, I just went, nah, I don't even care. And I didn't try to beat him because I could not stand his mechanics. Am I going to say the whole Manus fight is terrible? No, I'm going to point out the one mechanic that I genuinely think is poorly designed and that's it. The rest of Manus is awesome. Everything I like, every part of that fight was fantastic except for that one attack that he has. That's it. That bumpier mechanical ride, so to speak. It literally, I, I will say objectively, it does. It's why MMO people are so fucking crazy. Because we dealt with problems in the game. We got past it. The reason they're so crazy, though, is because we got past it with other people. I still remember my friend from, I, I, it just, I don't remember where, but somewhere in Europe on RuneScape, like we were both like 14 or 15. K guy, you will never see this probably, but hi, if you remember some low level with a stupid name, like attack chaos, something hi. I remember playing RuneScape. I remember being up every night until like 4 a.m. Mining and cutting down trees. No, I don't think I will. Yeah, Cutscenes are great. Isn't that the game from the guys who made Sonic? No. That's Sega. That's Sonic Team. The people that don't know how to make a Sonic game. And we may find ourselves far more artistically, spiritually fulfilled for taking that chance and enduring it. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure hey! We finished. It, it took an hour and 40 minutes to watch a 10 minute video. Be sure to like, subscribe, all that daft YouTube stuff. It really helps the channel and it means the world. A massive thanks as well to my patrons who you can see on screen and are all getting access to exclusive, fully produced videos that aren't available here. Your continued support. Okay, if anybody liked this video and you want more videos like this, be cool people and, and go subscribe to this, this guy. Go subscribe to Riding on Games on YouTube. Go check them out. This is a good video. This means you're absolutely going to finish Balan Wonderland, right? <laughs> or is that after Jack Wonderland? <laughs>